I tell you, if I was up here, I'd volunteer. I learned a long time ago that, that it's in those type of settings God proves he's God. And uh, I tell people, uh, we kind of pioneered down in the United States 30 years ago, or 25 years ago, uh, prophetic evangelism and dream evangelism. And I mean, when we started doing this, nobody was doing it. In fact, <clears throat> like I'm sure, Sean, you may have experience, I know I have, and that is that people wonder, why in the world are you going to those people? You know, we would go out to New Age fairs and psychic fairs and, and Renaissance fairs and witch festivals and pagan festivals. And, and it's like we were the plague from the church because we went out to save people and that the church was ignoring. And, um, and I'll tell you what, in those settings, I learned God was really God. I watched him back me up in things that I thought, oh, dear, if you don't come through, it's, it's a here I come, Jesus. <laughs> and uh, and he, backed, he backs you up. It's amazing. And it's amazing what love does. We've had witches just collapse. I've had witches collapse in my arms, crying, weeping, snot covering my shirt. Because they were so touched by love. Changes, transforms you. So, uh, Sean didn't know I was going to say this, but uh, and neither did I. I just am so deeply moved by this type of, of outreach that changes, changes lives, changes destinies, changes the atmosphere. And... Uh, it is truly, truly amazing. I'm, I'm deeply touched and deeply moved. Boy. I'm hoping to have a little lighter message tonight. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> uh, uh, property people are known for their sternness, and I'm really a very happy man. <laughs> uh, I feel like the the guy that you know God says I want to take the weak things to confound the wise. I'm going to take the happy man and make him look stern. <laughs> you think if you think I look stern now, you ought to see me before my beard turned white. I had black eyebrows, black hair, and a black beard. I looked just like uh, uh, Sasquatch. <laughs> in, well, if you would, turn in your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 15. I want to talk about destiny tonight. I want to talk about it in a little bit different way than perhaps you may have heard of it before. Destiny, purpose, what God has called you to become, what lies ahead of you and is waiting on you that God knows is coming to you, but you don't know is coming to you. Before any, before any of us get to a destiny, there's always things that stand in our way. Higher purpose, higher tests. Always things that stand in our way. And when you take a look at the word of God, you'll find that's true in all the great, all the great men and women of God. Things stood in the way, and they had to do something about it. Whenever you interpret scripture, there's, about, there's four major ways to interpret scripture. You can interpret from the literal standpoint. You can interpret from the allegorical standpoint. You can interpret it from the philosophical standpoint. And you can, then you can interpret from what is called <clears throat> the mysterious or hard to find, hard to, to recognize standpoint. I'm probably going to hit all of those tonight in, in this message. All of us have 
prophecies that we're waiting for. We're waiting for them to come true. I've had prophecies that I'm living, I'm living a prophecy right now that, that was given to me by another prophetic voice 30, in 1981. And it's just now happening. 32 years later, it's just now happening. That's not long at all compared to Daniel. You didn't get that, huh? <laughs> Daniel's waited about 3,000 years for his. Directly parallel to the things that the children of God had to face when they went into their promised land. We have to face today. And, and oh, by the way, did you know I told the, the, the pastors to lunch this, there's three ways to measure time. There's, there's the A.D., which means after Christ. There's the B.C., before Christ. And, but then there's the way the Hebrew people measure time, and that is from the start of creation. From basically the day that Adam sinned, they can count time, because they know he lived 930 more years from the day he sinned. So you kind of count time that way. We don't know how old, we don't know how long he lived before he sinned. He could have lived thousands of years. We just don't know. But we do know that from the day he sinned, he lived 930 years. And interestingly enough, then, if you count that, then you find that Abraham was born in 1948. 1,948 years after Adam came Abraham. Interesting because... In 1948, 1,948 years after the last Adam, Jesus came Israel. I don't think that's a coincidence. So there's things that are parallel. The natural things speak of invisible things. And there's invisible things that we're going to have to fight that are spoken about the natural things that the children of Israel had to go through. In Genesis chapter 15, verses 16 through 21... Abraham is given a promise from God. And he's, in this promise, there's listed ten nations that his descendants are going to have to fight when he doesn't even have one descendant yet. Here's what it says. But in the fourth generation, this is Abraham, this is when the God comes down, he's cut the, the, the sacrifices in two, he's got the dove as well and the, and the pigeon as well. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here, your descendants. For the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, there were appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Raphaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gergesites, and the Jebusites. I've given these nations to your descendants. They will conquer them. Ten nations. It's interesting, he said, that the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. There's a lot to say about the iniquity of the, of the Amorites. It's from the Amorites that they continued the Raphaim. It's from the Amorites that, that the giants came forth in the land. G Og. Don't know exactly how tall Og was, but we do know this. King Og had a bed that was 14 and a half feet long, made of iron and Eight feet wide because he was so big. That's a pretty big boy. Giants. And from this we learn something else. That God waits till iniquity is fulfilled before you overcome something that is mightier than you. He waits on them to get stronger before he brings you into the picture and is justified in using you. We're going to see more about that in just a moment. Well, Abraham goes on. He has children, you know, Isaac, Ishmael. Isaac's descendants grow. Jacob comes. 
Jacob's descendants grow. They end up going to Israel, are going down to Egypt because Joseph was down there, sold into slavery. And about 70 people eventually go to Joseph, who's working for Pharaoh at the time. And within 400 years, those 70 become, including men, women, and children, over 2 million people. Abraham's vision is coming to pass. Now he was told, when, as they were getting ready to come into the land, Moses is told, when you get to come into the land, you are to do certain things. You are to drive out, get rid of the enemy. You are to get rid of their engraved stones. You are to tear down their molten images and their high places and drive the inhabitants out of the land. And the provision will be there for you to do this. Allegorically, we could say this, that, that, that the, the engraved stones represent painful memories that we have in our lives that keep us so tied down, so paralyzed, we don't dare take a chance to do anything. Molded images are idols that we seek comfort from in times of trouble instead of God. That's what an idol is. High places. Things we see first are the first things we feel. Negative expectations instead of courage and hope for tomorrow. Inhabitants, mental strongholds that have separated us from God. Things that dwell in our mind, our thoughts, our precepts, our opinions that grow because we've not yet conquered the ways we used to think. We have a, a desire to get to our destiny, have a desire to get to what God wants us to do, but we're held back by, by these issues. Well, the children of Israel had two opportunities to go into the promised land. They were 11 days away. 11 days away. When the children of Israel and the 10 spies came back, Oh, the 12 spies came back. Ten of them gave a bad report. Twelve spies came back. Eleven days and they could have gone into their promise. And here's what I found. Right before you enter into what God wants you to do, there will always be a test to see if you have the courage to do it. There will always be a test. And it will be a big one. It will be directly proportionate to the benefit you're about to receive. Small test, small benefit. Great test, great benefit. And we always complain when this happened. We always complain. In Numbers 13, the first time, beginning with verse 25 through uh, 1325 through 1410. It's important I read this entire passage because there's so many points in it we're going to cover. And they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh, and they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told, they told him and said, Moses, we went to the land where you sent us, and truly it flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of a knock there. The descendants of a knock were the giants, by the way. I mean, true giants. And the Amalekites dwell there in the land of the south, the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains and the Canaanites dwell by the sea along the bank of the Jordan. You could almost hear their voices getting weaker and weaker. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses. I love this. I love this. Caleb says, Great, let's go up at once, right now. 
And they go, they don't want to. The men who had gone up with him said, we're not able to go up against his people. They're stronger than we are. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land, which they spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone is as spies as a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people we saw are men of great stature. <laughs> we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And we were like grasshoppers in their sight too. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and they cried and the people wept all night long. Oh, they, what is going on? We've been tried so hard. What is taking place? <laughs> I've carried my tent all these years. Oh, look what we've got. You can almost feel their passion. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt. If only we had died in this wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword? Why? Our wives, our children should become victims. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let's select another leader, and let's return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephthah, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This land we pass through to spy out is exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into the land and give it to us. It's a land that flows with milk and honey. Don't rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land. They are our bread. Meaning, whatever they do will only make us stronger as God conquers them. Don't fear the people. They are our bread. Their protection has departed from them. Now see, this is incredible because Joshua must, surely Joshua knew this invisible world. And that the demonic forces that protected them, if they enter the land, they will flee at the presence of the Lord. Because we are not mere men fighting the giants of Anak. We are the representatives of the Most High God. Joshua and Caleb knew this. The people seemingly forgot this. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And all the congregations said to stone them with stones. Wow. And they probably would have had the glory of the Lord not appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. Here's six signs of a bad report. We're not able to do this. We can't go up against this people. The circumstances are stronger than we are. The situation devours anybody who comes near it. This is just, there's no way we can overcome it. The cards are stacked against us. The people there are great stature. They're ready. They're, they've been prepared for us. We're nothing to them. They're giants. We're grasshoppers. They're squishes. Bad report. Six human solutions to a bad report. Cry and cry all night. <laughs> Complain against the leadership. Get, have a grassroots movement that gets everybody on your side. Always tell the leadership it would be better for us to serve the enemy than to serve you. It's the problem of the leadership, so let's get another pastor. And all the congregation said, Amen. Stone him. T 
Ten godly responses. Let's go do it now. Take the possession. We're, we're able to overcome them. The land is our destiny. It's worth the battle. If the Lord delights in us, there's nothing they can do to stop us. He'll conquer the enemy. He'll bring us into this land. He'll give it to us. It flows with milk and honey. Let's go. Only don't rebel against the Lord. Don't fear the people. Remember, they are our bread. This situation is only meant to make us stronger. Let's seize it. The Lord is with us. Their protection has departed. Our angels are with us. Do not be afraid. Wow. Easy to say. Two guys meant it. The other ten. No one can quote their names today. You may find them in the word, but nobody has them on the tip of their tongue. I've never seen anyone erect a monument to a coward. If you want to be a champion of God, you're going to have to fight great battles. Here's a lesson I learned. Little bitty battles produce little bitty victories and result in little bitty champions. Great battles produce great victories and result in great champions. We have to make up our mind, what do we want? Well, you know the choice they made. Forty years went by. Moses, in his closing discourse, the book of Deuteronomy, is basically the goodbye message of Moses to the children of Israel. And in the end of it, he, he reminds them, hey, you're going to you're gonna have to, you're going to have to overcome the nations that God talked to Abraham about. And oh, by the way, seven of those ten are mightier than you. Seven? Not just one? No, no. Seven are mightier than you. And the only way you're going to conquer them is by, guess what? God. Doesn't it seem unfair for God to ask us to conquer something greater than us? I remember, I remember telling my wife when I first went in the ministry 30 plus years ago, I said, I feel like a nickel sent to do a dollar's job. You know, and those of you that are ministry, you know what I'm talking about. And, and the difference is I just didn't have enough sense to do it. <laughs> There's like two waves. The guys that really got it at first, the early adopters, and then the late adopters, the wave that comes, the second, the second row of laughter. Okay, well. <laughs> so the second opportunity. This time after 40 years, it took 40 years to prepare 40,000 men who, in, who Joshua says, in Joshua 4.13, were prepared for war. 40,000 men who said, all right, they're our bread. Their protection has left them. We're ready. 40,000 for 40 years. Now, this is very interesting because when you take a look at those 10 tribes and you look at the meaning of the name of the 10 tribes, you're going to find, and we're going to see it in just a minute, you're going to find the 10 battles you're going to have to face to reach your destiny. They may have flesh and blood, but you're going to find the 10 battles. So let's put up that, the first overhead. I think we have it. Uh, 
Okay, let's go to the next one. Ah, the first one. Okay. These first three are the ones you can conquer all by yourself. And, here, and herein is a test in itself. Because any time you think you can conquer it, the next thing you fight is pride for conquering it. And so here's, what, here's the issue. Ken, Kenite. The Kenites. The meaning of the word Kenite means fabricator. What, is they fab, what would they fabricate? Lies false accusations against you. Lies will be spread about you. Distortions will be spread about you. Rumors will be spread about you. And the test is, will you defend yourself or will you let God? Because you know you can defend yourself. You can overcome this. But will you do it or you will, let, will you let God defend you? The second one, the Kenizzites. The Kenizzites. The meaning of Kenizzite means possessive. The, the, the trial or test is covetousness. What does that mean? It means we try to look more spiritual than we are. We try to have what others had, keeping up with others. And this keeps us from becoming what we were created to be. Because we'll never be what God created us to be if we're trying to be what somebody else is. So we have to make our ministries look a certain way. We have to make our homes look a certain way. We have to drive a certain car. We have to do any number of things. Now, I'm not against any of those things, but it can't be because we're trying to keep up with somebody. So you're going to have to overcome this issue of covetousness and trying to look more spiritual. Just You feel the presence of God around me? Not around you, around me. Get close to me. It'll rub off on you. Yeah, those of you in the ministry know these people. Yeah. Follow me. Do what I do. The Holy Spirit and I are just like this. That's me on top. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but not a lot. <laughs> the third one that we can overcome is the Cadmonites. The Cadmonites mean ancient ways. It's what a religious spirit is made from. Tradition as treated as if it were scripture, and the old wine is good enough. We can't change. We can't do it that way. We've always done it this way. What do you mean, put lights in here? What's wrong with the lights we got 150 years ago? What do you mean change the carpet? I don't see the floor yet coming through it. A few threads, what does that mean? See, the old is good enough. Hate change. The old is good enough. Tradition, well, we've always done it this way. Brother, we can't change. We've always done it this way. You'll never enter your destiny when the old is good enough. Here's the seven that are stronger than you are. The Hittites. First thing you hit is terror. What is that terror in you? It's the fear of failure. And you know what it does? It creates paralysis in your life. Spiritual paralysis. You're afraid to do anything because we're not spiritual enough. What if we fail? What would the people say? If we fail, people won't think we're spiritual. I can't do it. It's too big for me. I can't take on that project. It's too big for me. I don't think there'd ever been a shake the lake if, it, if Sean ever thought about that. I don't think Pastor Peter and Catherine would have their had their church, if they'd ever thought about that, it's too big for me. So it keeps you awake at night, too big for me. I can't handle it, can't control it. What if there's something I don't know? If, if you're waiting to know everything before you do anything, you'll never do anything. 
because there's always something more to learn. The next one is parasites. Parasites means squatter. What does that mean? It means apathy. In Texas, we have a law, and the law is called squatter's rights, and it says this. If somebody comes and lives on your land for seven years, the land is no longer yours, it's theirs. Because you were apathetic and didn't care to remove them. You obviously weren't paying attention to your land, and that's why they lived there, because you didn't drive them out. So it's apathy. You're not trying. You're not paying attention. Things have always been this way. We can't change things. We ignore things. We neglect things. So why try? Apathy. The church is too big. I can't change it. The pastor won't listen to me. I can't change it. Nobody will, walk, will follow me. I can't do it. Apathy. It kills churches. Here's a little secret I found after planting five churches and pastoring three other churches and being on staff at three other churches. Churches ranging from, so I've pastored in and or been on staff at churches ranging from 50 people to 5,000 people. And here's what I've learned. I've learned that the first people you're going to lose are the people that are apathetic. Because they won't help you build your vision, and God will be sure to remove them. God will remove them. Because they will not help you build your building. They will not help you advance the kingdom. They will not want to teach Sunday school. They will not help with children. They won't pick up the trash. They won't clean the carpets. They won't do parking lot detail. All of these are important to the kingdom. But apathy... Who cares if the church grows? Who cares if the kingdom grows? God cares. The next one is the Raphaim. It literally means giant. High bites came from this. And the trial is to flee or run away. You thought it was God, but it's too big, and evidently it isn't God because it's really not working like I thought it would work. You give up, you surrender, you think this is too big, we made a mistake, God really didn't tell us to do this, I don't know what I was thinking. So you quit. So many people quit before the miracle comes. So many people quit. But see, you never need a miracle till you need a miracle. And if you quit before the miracle gets there, you don't get your miracle. And then you say, well, God's never done anything in my life. Well, when did you quit? Before he could do it? There will always be something too big for you. Something insurmountable. Something you don't have any, enough to do. You don't have enough money to do. You don't have enough time to do. You don't have enough passion to do. You don't have enough knowledge to do. There'll always be something too big. The next spirit that you're going to have to conquer to get to your destiny is the Amorite spirit, or I call it the Amorite spirit. It's Amorite. Amorites mean sayer, a sayer. What does a sayer do? A sayer is always saying something about you. It creates inferiority in your mind, in your perceptions. It creates self-doubt in your heart. And you always have a feeling people are talking about you, listening, and you're trying to listen to what other people say about you. You walk into a room and the conversation stops you and you go, they were talking about me. You never think that they may have just finished the conversation. They're talking about me. And you know that everyone, everywhere you go, is talking about you. How, and it's not how good you are, it's how bad. Oh, look at how he's dressed. Look at how she's dressed. Look at that. Not a name brand on those trousers. No, nope, not. Look at that blouse. Oh, ugly color. Oh, man, I wouldn't wear that to a dog show. Oh, man. You know, all those wonderful sayings that, that people lovingly say, that's what you think they're saying about you. And they could be saying, man, I wish I looked that good. 
but you don't think that because a sayer tells you it's not good what they're saying about you, and it's all designed to make you feel inferior and create self-doubt. Because if you feel inferior and you create self-doubt, you'll always want to go back to eating onions in Egypt. The next one is the Canaanites. Canaanite means zealous. Zealous, yeah. Over, ze over too much zeal. Premature opportunity. And so you see an opportunity, but you don't wait on the timing of the Lord. You're impatient. You go after it too quickly, and nothing works out the way you thought you were, so you get dis you, the way you thought it would, so you get discouraged when things don't work as quickly as you wanted. You get to the town where you're going six months early and you're dangling for six months because you didn't wait on God to say, when do you want me to move? So you dangle for six months. You go, go, well, God, where are you? He says, I'm back here. Or you move six months too late and where you're at is filling up the water. You're up to your nose and you say, oh, God, you said you'd get me out of this flood. And he's back. I did, but you wouldn't get in the boat. So we're too late, too early. Zeal. Zeal. And after you've had a few times of being overzealous, you now don't trust your ability to make decisions anymore. And then you don't make decisions. And then you start looking for someone else to make your decision for you. And there'll be plenty of people wanting to make decisions for you. Follow me, I'll, I'll show you what to do. The next one is Girgashite. The Girgashites. Now this is much more prevalent than you may know. It means stranger, or you will feel out of place. You're frustrated because you don't find you fit in. And it, it may be you've been going to your church for 15 years, and you go, I just don't feel at home here. Out of place. I don't fit in. They're not like me. I'm not like them. And the enemy loves to do this because it keeps you from growing roots. And without any roots, you have very little fruit. Fruit production is directly tied to root growth. No root, no fruit. And if the enemy can keep you fruitless, then he's neutered you so you can't hurt his kingdom. You are neutered. You may not help his kingdom, but you don't hurt his kingdom. And by the way, not hurting his kingdom is helping his kingdom. Because it grows when people don't try to stop it. That's a test you're going to have to face. Because before, sooner or later, you're going to have to come to a place is, when will I grow roots? Destiny is tied to roots. The final one is the Jebusite spirit. It means downtrodden. The name Jebusite means downtrodden. It produces anxiety and depression. And it creates a victim mentality. And you'll blame others for your lack of success. Or you'll always feel condemned for not doing enough. I'm not doing enough. I'm not doing enough. I'm not doing enough. Or you blame others for your lack of success. Victim mentality. 
Cain was an evidence of a victim mentality. Abel, if Abel wasn't here, my sacrifice would have been accepted. Downtrodden, anxiety, depression. You're going to have to overcome that. These ten things are ten battles that you will face. I don't know anyone who has ever become anything that didn't have to overcome these ten issues. You're going to fight them, and you won't just fight them once. There will be many battles in the war. You'll fight them, and you'll think you've conquered it, and then you'll go, well, God, I thought I had that taken care of. Why is it happening again? He said, because we're going deeper. You just, you just took care of the corporals. We're going to have you start taking care of some of the sergeants. And by the way, there's lieutenants behind them and colonels behind them. So we're going to go pretty deep here. But I can't. Uh, 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 you what? Oh, uh, okay. Okay, I'm going to handle this battle. Yes, good job. Handle this battle. I will strengthen you. This battle is your bread. It will make you stronger for the next battle. That will become your bread, make you stronger for the next battle. That will become your bread, make you stronger for the next battle. And pretty soon, you win the war, and guess how strong you'll be at the end of that war? Strong enough for the Raphaim. And the next one. But you will be mighty men and women prepared for battle. And you'll know this. I didn't do it. God did. I didn't do it. You see, God has to bring you face to face with issues that are bigger than you so you know God did it, I didn't. I, God did it, I didn't. God did it, I didn't. See, the real battle is what will you do after everything is done? Will you say, look what I did? as Nebuchadnezzar, who walked on the walls of his palace, palatial grounds, looked at all, surveyed his kingdom, and said, look what I built. And the next thing you know, he's eating grass. Abraham was a mighty man. He took 318 men. And by the way, All but one, and Ishmael may not have been there because may have been too young, but most of, those, most of those men were just servants. The day they were serving bread, milking the cows, cleaning the tent, and tomorrow they're fighting five different kingdoms who took Lot and his family. 318 men. Drove away over 20,000. Gideon, 300 men. Drove away 120,000. 300 men. Gideon started out with 35,000 that rallied to him. And God said, oh, you're depending on numbers? <laughs> Remove 22,000 at one whack simply by saying, tell everybody who's afraid to go home. 22,000 left. Uh, that didn't help us fear. Oh, you're still afraid? Watch how they drink water, and if they don't drink water right, tell them to go home. All of them but 300 drink water wrong. God's always going to bring you face to face with something greater than you. So what did he do with Gideon? He said, Gideon, I want you to go down to the enemy's camp. And there I will strengthen you. So Gideon's going, wait a minute. 
You're not even going to let me have 300? And the Lord said, well, if you're afraid, you can take your servant Pura with you. And he took Pura, his servant, with him. So he didn't die alone. He gets to the enemy's camp, and he hears two soldiers talking. Now, he's in the midst of the enemy's camp. He hears two soldiers talking, and this one soldier says, I had a dream. The other soldier says, what was it? The other soldier says, said, I saw a loaf of bread on top of the mountain, and it came rolling down the hill and gathered great speed and rolled through our tents and destroyed us. And the other soldier goes, I know what this means. It's none other than Gideon. Now, isn't that what you'd think? Loaf of bread, Gideon. Actually, there is some logic to it, because guess what? In the beginning of the story, we're introduced to Gideon as a baker. He was grinding wheat. So he was a baker. So who was the baker in the area? Gideon. Loaf of bread, baker, comes Gideon. And when that happens, when Gideon hears this, Gideon does something very strange for a coward. Because up to now, he was. He stands up, he says, and, he, he, and said, and Gideon, hearing the meaning of the dream, stood up and worshipped God in the midst of the enemy's camp. And he walks back to his 300 men and says, 300 is too many. So 100 of you go over there, 100 of you go over there, 100 of you follow me, all watch me. Where'd the coward go? You're going to come face to face with your worst fear before you reach your destiny. There's not a leader who's worth the salt who has ever walked into his leadership, his destiny, his purpose for being on earth, that he didn't face his worst fear. God will not let you get rid of your boss because there will be another boss. But he will make you come face to face with your boss. And if you allow God to handle it, things will be resolved. And then you'll never be afraid of your boss again. You want to say something? You're testifying. I love that. So, those ten fears. And here's what I feel like the Lord has told me tonight that he wants to do. He wants you to stand up, not yet, but he wants you to stand up and volunteer. Say, okay, Lord, I want to reach my destiny, and I want you, I'm going to volunteer for you to begin to remove these things that I'm afraid of so I can walk into it. And I know there will be a battle. Now, you may also have to say this. I had to say this. I had to say, Lord, listen to me. I'm of a sound mind right now. And I know that later when you start doing this, I'm going to tell you, stop it. But don't listen to me then. Listen to me now. I will not be of a sound mind then. I am of a sound mind now. So I'm just letting you know that I know I will do this don't pay attention to me. Listen now. Some of you may have to kind of say that to God. Listen now. And when I start complaining, ignore me. Ignore me. Don't listen to me. I don't care how much I cry. I may cry all night. Don't listen to me. Because I want to reach my destiny. And I have failed. I've looked at the giants and I've run. I've allowed what people say about me to keep me back. I will not allow any of these ten issues to hold me back any longer. But I know this. I can't do it by myself. You have to do it. So I'm calling on your name to handle these issues for me. So if that's you, I want you to stand and we're going to pray. Because God will act on your behalf. He will act. He, he didn't put you here to leave you. He put you here to accomplish, to become 
what it's called you to be. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to touch this people and their courage to stand right now. They've recognized issues in their life that they've faced before and backed away from. They've recognized issues that, that they've seen ahead and decided they wouldn't even go that far. I ask you, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, to give them courage and to make up the difference between their courage and your ability. Make up the difference, O oh God. There is a difference between our courage and your ability. Your ability is far higher than even our courage will take us. But Father, we take this stand in courage, and we ask you now, make up the difference. We can't slay the giants, but you can. We can't stop what people say about us, but you can. And you could at least blind me to what they say and stop my ears so I don't even pay attention. I won't even notice it anymore. And Father, if there's anything I've been apathetic to, remove my apathy from me. If there's anything that I'm terrorized by that's paralyzed me and kept me from doing anything, remove that from me. And if I'm too zealous in certain areas, give me peace and calm me down so I do not take premature opportunity. All of these ten things, Father, help me. And I will follow you. I know you will strengthen me. I know you will strengthen this people. And I know that if they are serious, Canada will become a different nation. Because they will teach their children the ways of the Lord. And the way of justice. And the way of righteousness. And you will know them. And they will know you. And everything will change. For your glory, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.